Psalm 94 says, He that formed the eye, shall he not see? God formed the eye. Eyeballs are incredibly complicated. Charles Darwin said, To suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. But then he goes on for three or four pages and says how he thinks it happened anyway. Your eyeball is amazing. You know, at the back of your eye, there are 137 million light-sensitive cells in one square inch called your retina, all of them wired straight to the brain. How would you like to hook up 137 million electrical connections in one square inch? My Heavenly Father did. He's pretty smart, isn't he? Now, I debated one atheist one time, and he said, Hovind, the eye is an example for evolution because it's poorly designed. I said, what on earth are you talking about? He said, well, the light comes into your eye, and then it goes through blood vessels in front of the retina. He said, that's wired backwards. He said, the octopus has a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. I said, sir, let me just explain something to you, okay? I said, we live in the air. <clears throat> Now, air is a pretty poor insulator for UV light. So your body has, is designed with the blood vessels in front of the retina. That's your body's last defense against ultraviolet light. Now, octopus live in the water. Okay? Water blocks UV light. So they don't need their blood vessels in front. See, we're designed for living in air, and they're designed for living in water. Now, if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you just go ahead, sir, but you're going to be blind in a few days, okay? Because they don't have the blood vessels in front to block the UV light. What a dumb evidence for evolution. What they're trying to say is, well, God wouldn't do it this way, so it must have evolved. Well, that's a silly argument for evolution. Maybe you just don't understand why it was designed that way. I think man's understanding of the human body is about like putting a five-year-old kid under the hood of your car and saying, hey, kid, take out whatever this thing doesn't need. You don't know what any of it does. You can take it all out, right? You know, your eyeball is amazing. It would take a minimum of 100 years of Cray computer time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. Eyeballs are amazing. But this textbook says, the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. Why doesn't God get the glory for what he did? This textbook shows the kids a bird eye and a reptile eye, and it says right up here, boys and girls, you can better understand how the eye might have evolved if you picture a series of changes. You have to imagine how it happened. Just imagine the eye changing. That's not science, <laughs> imagining how it happened. Where's the evidence? See, evolution only takes place in the imagination. It never takes place in reality. They're lying to you, okay? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? Science deals with things we can observe and study and test. You don't observe anything about evolution. If you have something that's designed like an eyeball, it demands a designer. If painting is proof there was a painter, even if you never see the guy. A building is proof there was a builder, and a watch is proof there was a watchmaker, and design, the creation is proof there was a creator. See, design simply demands a designer, period. The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They are without excuse, the Bible says. There's no excuse. The psalmist said, when I consider the heavens. You know, God knows that the study of science will draw us to Him. Satan knows that too. So Satan has worked really hard in the field of science to make sure it pushes kids away from God. And we need some good godly science teachers to get involved in the school system and turn this thing around. Okay? And by the way, we can prove the existence of God by the impossibility of the contrary. It's impossible that there not be a designer. It's just not possible. There had to be a designer, okay? I like to show evolutionists this picture. I say, guys, here we have, as far as I know, the world's largest rock group. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know of a bigger one? I'd like to see it, okay? Um, I'll say, do you think there's any way George Washington's face could have appeared on this rock by chance? I say, no, it was designed by a guy named Borglum. Took him a long time to build it. Okay, very good. Now, let me ask you a question. You say there's no way this uh, face could appear on the rock by chance. You don't think wind could have done that, abrasion, exfoliation, thermal expansion of the rock? Nothing? Nope, nope, happened by, happened by design. Okay, now let me ask you this question. Do you think George Washington himself, with 50 trillion cells in his body, 
and all these complex systems happen by chance? I say, yeah. No, wait, wait, wait. You don't think his face could appear on a rock by chance, but you do think his whole complex anatomy could happen by chance. Are you dumb in any other area, or is that the only one, you know? <laughs> then they tell kids that plants are adapted to their environment. Adapted? Yes, boys and girls, gills are an adaptation to living in water. Oh, well, how did they live before they adapted the gills? Hmm? Well, you see, Mr. Hoven, for millions of years, they all died. None of them lived until they adapted the gills. Oh, I see. Why don't they say it's a design feature? See, they avoid using the word designed because then some kid's going to say, who's the designer? Hmm? Adaptations for living on land. Legs. Oh, yes, boys and girls. Legs support the body's weight as well as allow movement from place to place. Well, that's true. It doesn't prove they adapted by themselves, though. Lungs. Oh, boy, the delicate structure of a fish's gills depends on water for support. On land, lungs carry out gas exchange. That's true. That's not proof one changed to the other, though. They just make this mental, imaginary connection in the kids' minds. I've got a Casio databank stopwatch, or uh, watch, okay? Holds 300 phone numbers. It's a calculator, stopwatch, an alarm clock, and a countdown timer. It does not tell time. I have to look at it. But it's a pretty amazing machine, 70 bucks at Walmart. Um, I was in Japan a couple years ago, but I did not see the guy who makes the Casio databank watch. I never saw him. Do I have to see the guy who made it to believe he exists? Hmm. Is it logical for me to stand here in Tennessee and say, I believe there's a watch designer in Japan that made this thing? Is that logical? Even if I never see him? Sure. Would it be illogical for me to say, I've never seen him, so I don't believe he exists. That would be totally dumb, wouldn't it? And you don't have to see the Creator to believe he exists, okay? Evolutionists argue against design using arguments they designed. Mm, think about that one. Here's a great book talking about the complexity of living things at a micro scale. We sell the book at our website. Michael Behe wrote this on Darwin's Black Box. He spends a whole chapter describing the hair on a bacteria. That hair is so complicated, it's attached to a little tiny motor. The motor is so tiny that eight million of them would fit in the cross section of a human hair, but the motor turns 100,000 RPM. Let's see you build a motor like that. Pretty amazing. And as things get smaller, the world they live in feels more sticky to them. The viscosity of the fluid seems greater. So a bacteria swimming through water is about like a person swimming through peanut butter. And that little motor is so powerful and turns so fast, that bacteria can swim about like a person going 60 miles an hour through peanut butter. We've got a little model of it in our museum if you want to come down and see how they work. And the textbook says, humans probably evolved from bacteria more than 4 billion years ago. What? They can swim through peanut butter 60 miles an hour. We should sign them up for the Olympics, man. We evolved from them? <laughs> We're getting worse, not better. It's a lie. Nothing this small and complex could have happened by chance. This is a great book that we sell in our bookstore. Just simple illustrations. Could a box evolve? Could an ink pen evolve? Could a paper clip evolve? It just goes through a bunch of simple things and shows it just can't happen, okay? Then they talk about the origin of life. Yes, boys and girls, how living things started from non-living matter. This is pure baloney, how they teach this in the books. We're going to cover that after a quick break cover a few more lies in the textbooks, and then tell you what you can do about it. Some practical steps to fix the problem right after the break.